Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India friends uh, today we are going to take up unit third and within that we have the major topic on present movement in india i think uh, we have talked a lot about how the peasantry and the rural society has been seen we have tried to see the conceptual framework and also we try to see that how the rural society and peasantry they go together we also have tried to discuss in the unit first the various concept related to the rural society we have spoken about the dominant caste we have spoken about uh, the issue of jajwani system we have spoken about the caste as a phenomenon and also we try to see about the origin of rural sociology and many other things uh, we also try to explore what are the trends on village studies uh, which has been part and parcel of unit 1 and in unit 2 we try to uncover the theoretical framework how the various scholars in the field of present studies tries to uncover the present uh, we have seen the economic reference of the peasantry we have seen the cultural reference of peasantry we also try to speak about the issues related to the debates on peasantry and also we try to speak about certain other aspect which are related to peasantry in terms of economy polity and also uh, the sort of uh, new uh, things which have emerged basically in the global and the post modern era that is the issue of the moral economy of the peasantry so i think uh, uh, these are certain things uh, which we try to cover up and now we are venturing into the new aspect that is the present movement in india uh, as of now we simply try to see how peasantry has been seen as object and in that framework we try to see how we can put them in into the theoretical discourse how we are trying to treat the peasantry vis-a-vis -vis the state policies but the reactionary component of the peasant has not been taken up very seriously i think in the Uh, last component of james c scott that is uh, the moral economy of the peasantry we try to deal with the issue of uh, uh, peasantry uh, in terms of uh, their co contribution towards uh, how they can cope up with the state policies and the market situation but actively how they can come by their own that component is missing especially we try to speak about the marxian framework of peasantry but marx himself was not very sure about uh, the revolutionary character of peasant and he was trying to say that it is their mode of production uh, which basically isolates them or rather which does not unites them to come together for any specific revolutionary framework so that way i think uh, the understanding of the peasant has been seen uh, from one framework that is how they can be seen as an object but now the unit 3 as the title itself speaks that we try to speak about the various present movements which took place in india i think uh, somewhere we try to see that uh, the present movement uh, are to be seen as uh, a sort of a, a revolution which has taken place in the countryside and how uh, certain movements becomes the instances of the drastic changes in the countryside uh, these are certain important things uh, which we have to keep in mind and keeping those consideration we have here documented at least a few prominent present movement which occurred in india and which has attracted the attention of the various social scientist uh, either it's the historian or it is the sociologist or it is a political scientist or maybe we try to speak about the journalist 
most of them have tried to focus upon these movements in their own way. Like we have under this categorization the movement of the concern uh, which can be seen as the specific movements in the different time frame. Like we have the Tebhaga revolt which has been there, we will speak about uh, the Telangana revolution and also we will try to speak about the movement which are related to Naxalbari and also we will have certain issues related to the new farmers movement. So, that way if you try to see I think uh, most of the movements which we are trying to cover up they will be speaking about uh, the sort of resistance which has been generated in the countryside in the different framework and I think uh, the issues that has been quite prominent within these movements are related to land. And I think uh, in order to make a distinction between the peasant and the farmers movement, I think that was one of the starting point that in the case of peasant movement, the issue has been the land. Uh, and on the other hand, when we try to speak about the farmers movement, the issues would have been different. But here, uh, our concern is more towards the understanding of uh, the peasant movement in India. And uh, within that framework, I think uh, topic 10 that is the Tebhaga revolt. I think this is uh, where we are trying to uh, uh, see it as the first case study uh, with regard to the present movement in India. Friends, uh, when we try to speak about uh, uh, this movement, but before that, let us try to see that what the movement is. Uh, basically, we try to see that movement has to be seen in terms of mobilization of the masses towards a collective end and uh, that way if you try to see, we will try to find out that uh, the movement has certain objectives in mind, they have a specific ideology, they have a specific leadership, they have the followers and a movement definitely has an end that is basically trying to bring about certain amount of changes in the society. These changes can be seen in terms of the bigger transformations also. So, that way if you try to see the movement as a phenomenon in terms of social change plays a crucial role in bringing about the change in the existing social structure and that is where we try to see the present movement becomes an important issue. And here the first case study that we are dealing in the 10th chapter that is on Tebhaga revolt. I think certain movements we try to see as revolt, uh, certain movements we will try to spell out in terms of rebellion, some movements we will try to see in the category of uh, the sort of resistance. So, I think uh, there are different meanings which are associated uh, with the aspect of the movement and I think uh, the trend of the specific movement may decide that how or why they can be treated as a revolt or a sort of a rebellion like we will try to speak about Mofla which is seen as a rebellion, Mofla rebellion, Tebhaga is a revolt, Naxalbari is a movement. So, why certain acts has been categorized differently, I think that is on the basis of uh, the sort of uh, causes or also the intensity of that particular movement that is going to decide in what nomenclature we are going to treat them at the holistic level. So, the Tebhaga revolt as we know it was a significant present agitation that was initiated in Bengal by the Kisan Sabha. The sharecroppers had a contracted to give half of their harvest to the landlords. The demand of Tebhaga that is Tebhaga is sharing by a third that is teen bhag uh, movement was to reduce the landlord share to one third that was the basic uh, uh, aspect of this movement. Uh, the genesis, the social conditions and the outcome of the movements are going to be taken care under this discussion. Thus, the section will reflect upon the social conditions and outcome of the movement in a broader framework. I think uh, before going into detail, uh, we have to see that uh, what is basically the agrarian social structure 
apart from the introduction that we will be understanding, we will try to see the agrarian social structure, we will try to speak about the political mobilization of the Bengal peasantry, we will try to see the nature of the sh sharecroppers revolt, we will try to see the social forces that weakened the movement and ultimately we will try to sum up the whole issue. So, the main thrust of this unit is to highlight the genesis of Tebhaga movement and also we will try to see what are the agrarian structures of Bengal and what is the outcome of this movement that is going to be an important issue. To begin with the Tebhaga movement in Bengal in the mid 40s was a struggle by the sharecropper to retain a two thirds share of the produce for themselves and thereby to reduce the rent they paid to the Jyotidars. A class of rich farmers who held superior rights in the land from one half to one third of their produce. The movement was limited in its impact and spread and was launched at the crucial juncture on the eve of India's independence and partition of the subcontinent. Prior to the Tebhaga struggle, many agrarian movements developed within the framework of Indian national movement, but a few exceptions their dominant ethos was the Gandhians as they thought the reformistic goal through the passive resistance and the non-violence. However, the Tebhaga movement was a marked departure from this pattern being the outgrowth of the left wing mobilization of the rural masses. It was the first consciously attempted revolt by a politicized peasantry in the Indian history. Therefore, the movement assumes a special significance in the study of Indian peasant struggle. Here an attempt has been made to trace the social origin and the structural setting of the Tebhaga movement to elicit its class character, leadership and the organizational aspect and to analyze the historical conditions in which it developed. Thus, the Tebhaga movement in terms of time frame it is 1946-47 and 1948-49 was a major present upheaval in Bengal in the 20th century. The movement failed after a tremendous sacrifice by sharecroppers and their allies, the landless laborers and the petty artisans, but it left a deep impression in the present psyche. Even after a generation, they nursed a grievance against the establishment. Hence, when Operation Barga was launched, a point arose as to how to motivate and inspire the sharecroppers to come in large number to record their names. Apart from the participatory methodology adopted for the purpose of recording their names, it was thought desirable to project this operation as the culminating stage of their Tebhaga struggle to get two thirds share of the crop waged three and half decade earlier. Now let us try to understand the agrarian social structure of Bengal. The British introduced the permanent settlement in Bengal that is the Zamindari in 1793 and thus inaugurated the new social arrangements on land. Revenue collecting intermediaries under the Mughal agrarian system were recognized as the landlord with full property right whereas the actual tillers were reduced to the status of how we can see the tenants by the new settlement. Notion of prestige prevented the zamindars from taking any entrepreneurial interest in the land management and improvement, while a population growth and a steadily rising demand for cultivable land led to sub infudication and rack renting throughout the 19th century. The extension of cultivation to all arable lands has reached saturation point by 1875. Due to the over utilization of land without the adequate capital inputs, the crop production had begun to decline, particularly in the first quarter of the present century. The slow disintegration of the rural industries and the absence of the new industrial enterprise and employment further accelerated the pressure on land. To contain a growing sub infudation in Bengal, the British in the course of land settlement created a number of intermediary tenures between zamindars and actual cultivators. Consequently, 
the new classes and the interest group emerged in the countryside. Although the number and variety of these intermediaries varied from place to place or from a state to a state, they could be broadly classified into five strata of agrarian hierarchy in Bengal. They were the zamindars and the talukdars that is the first category. The second category is bhadraloks, the, those who are the urban middle class and the jyotidars, the fixed rent riots. The third category was the under riots that is the tenant with inferior right. Fourth we have the bargadars, those who are the sharecroppers and the adhihars, those who were without any tenurial rights. And finally, we have the fifth category that is the landless agricultural laborers. The landlords held a large estate but subdivided them into smaller ones which they leased out either directly or through the talikdars to the jyotidars. The right of the jyotidar were permanent, transferable and hereditary and implied the power to sublet. The landlord paid the government the fixed amount of revenue and received from the jyotidar the rent fixed in perpetuity. Although some jyotidars were the men of enterprises, few of them really utilized their potential for revolutionizing the mode of agricultural production. Most preferred to sublet their plots to the bargadars for cultivation. Bargadars paid 50 percent of their produce as rent to the jyotidars. The underriers held the land directly under the landlord for a fixed period of time, but their tenures were inferior to those of jyotidars in terms of the market value as well as the social prestige and were not ordinarily saleable. The sharecropping arrangements ensured the jyotidars better returns without either any capital investment or the risk of accrual of any subtenural rights on their lands. So, Extoriation was the product uh, produce rent system that in the 1890s a share copper paid a rent that was 30 times more than the revenue his zamindar paid to the government. So, I think uh, this was basically seen as a system of exploitation of the cultivators. The growth of the class of bargadars in Bengal was not due to demographic and ecological crisis. The agrarian economy was paralyzed by the famine of 1943. Another reason for the crisis was owing to the shift from food crop that is paddy to the cash crop that is jute. From the mid 19th century, a large scale expansion of transport and communication brought the farm produce of the countryside within the reach of the urban markets. This resulted in the system of subsistence agriculture being supplanted by the new market economy. Land owning classes now became increasingly interested in directly securing crops for the market rather than in settling the peasants on land. Since a share in the produce gave the jyotidar access to the markets, they increasingly went in for crop sharing cultivation. The newly created tenure and sub tenures provided an opportunity for the men of high caste and urban interest groups to invest money in the landed property. Consequently, the land passed into the hands of the non cultivable classes. A number of lawyers, merchant traders, land speculators or brokers or the urban money lenders who constituted the Badrulog that is the urban middle class of Bengal became the jyotidars and under riots in this process. Those jyotidars who were money lenders and merchants naturally preferred the bargadari cultivation because their interest lay primarily in securing commercial crop for marketing purpose. The Bhadralok comprised mostly the upper caste Hindus such as the Brahmins, Kaista and Vaidyas who has both the desires and the resource to secure and English education and hence were to main source of uh, hence were the main source of recruitment to governmental services. Landed property to them was a symbol of prestige and status. It was also the safest field for investment in those days which explain why at the turn of the century there was in fact very few Bhadralok families 
without an interest in the landed rents. So, in Bengal the three sectors of the rural economy can be broadly identified as the landlord, tenant, sharecropper sector. The independent small holders sector which could apply to those jyotidars, tenants or underayas who had small holdings which they normally cultivate with the family labor and for the subsistence and the rich peasant farm labor sector. So, these sectors were not mutually exclusively uh, seen nor did they function independently of each other. Bargadars could be found in all the three of which however, the first sector was the most dominant that is the landlord tenant share copper sector. Now, let us try to see that uh, apart from this uh, agrarian structure uh, how the political mobilization of the Bengal peasantry took place. So, regarding that the effort to organize the peasant in Bengal dates back to the early 1920s when the new left wing enthusiasm in India was crystallizing into the concrete organizational form. The pioneers of the Bengal communist movement were Nalini Gupta and Muzaffar Ahmad who were convicted in the Kanpur conspiracy case. Uh, their release in the early 1926 coincided with the adoption of a new tactical line of organizing the workers and peasants party that is the WPP as the front line party in the Indian communist. The establishment of the WPP in Bengal was followed by enthusiastic activities on the rural front. A series of peasant and fishermen's conference were organized in the different districts. The objective of the Bengal WPP that is uh, uh, we try to see uh, the workers and the peasants party reflected the both the old and the new ideologies. The party they stood for complete independence based on the social and economic emancipation demanded the nationalization of all industries, service and the land. But interestingly enough affirmed its faith in the non-violent mass action as the principal means. In the 1920s there was another present organization the Royat Krishak Sabha that is basically the tenant and the present association of Bengal which was largely controlled by the rich farmers that is the substantial jyotidars and the underayas who in fact exploited the actual peasant that is the small holders and the bargadars far from far more than the zamindars did. This party was politically conservative and maintained the status quo and its leader wanted to make the new landlord out of a big tenants and were not at all willing to make the actual present class conscious. So, the Krishak Praja party which attained phenomenal electoral success in the 1930s drew its main support from the Muslim peasantry. It too represented the interest of substantial tenants and the rich peasants and its program laid emphasis on the abolition of the intermediary landlordism and on the establishment of the peasant proprietorship in land. Upholding the principle of liberal democracy, non-violence and the constitutional methods, it was totally opposed to the communism. Its leaders Fazul Haq, a prominent personality in the Bengal politics for many years used the Praja movement as his power base. The party was unpredictable phenomenon being connected to all but committed to none. Between 1932 and 1935 the Krishak Prajat party has come to dominate the local and the district board because of the tremendous following it had among the Muslim present masses in the north and the east Bengal where the bulk of landlords Mahajan and Jyotidars were Hindus. In alliance with the Congress the Praja party projected an anti-imperialist image and in 1937 the assembly election succeeded in capturing the votes of the Muslim poor peasants. The Krishak Praja party was thus able to form the first popular ministry in Bengal which subsequently appointed the Bengal Land Revenue Commissioner in 1938 to which reference has been made previously. The Bengal Kisan Sabha, the provincial branch of All India Kisan Sabha was set up in April 1936. In a sense it was a revival of the communist activities. This time 
under the garb of the United Front policy. Such a reactivation of leftist force in Bengal was eminent because many CPI workers had come in contact with number of Bhadralok terrorists and revolutionaries in jail. The later absorption into the CPI during the 1930s has vastly improved the party cadre. CPI membership has grown from 37 in 1934 to over 1000 in 1942 and almost to 20,000 in 1947. So, it speaks about the sort of dissatisfaction which has been there and many people had joined the CPI uh, in order to have certain reforms. Kisan Sabha leaders both at the local and the district level came either from the non-cultivating class, they were the teachers, university graduates or from some Jyotidar families. Initially both the WPP in the 20s and the Kisan Sabha in the 30s were dominated by a strong pro-rich and the middle peasant lobby, but from 1937 to 1940 or the so called the Bengal Kisan Sabha drifted gradually to the cause of the poor Bargadars and consequently there was a cut off from the support of rich and the middle peasants, although in some places the later continued to operate within the Kisan Sabha framework even after 1940s, but by and large the different agrarian classes were polarized to different political parties in Bengal by 1940. In the beginning of the Kisan Sabha unit focused attention on the local issues and mobilized the peasantry to resist the high local taxes, interest or the rental rates in some policy, uh, place. By 1938-39 the government was already anxious over the tenant no rent mentality which it attributes to the growing communist campaign in Bengal what perhaps radicalized the Kisan Sabha agitation politics was the complete change in the Krishak Praja party attitude towards agrarian problem and the question while in the office. The Praja party in 1937 election manifesto contained a promise to abolish landlordism and assuming the office its minister appointed the land revenue commissioner, but thereafter the party suddenly became ambivalent to agrarian question. Its ministers now began to openly defend the zamindari system as the archstone of society and to condemn the communism and anti-religious movements. The Krishak pa uh, Praja party government which is hundreds of CPI leaders and Kisan Sabha work in an attempt to check the spread of communism among the rural peasantry. So, virtually they wanted uh, to check or to have certain number of control in the countryside. Uh, natural calamities in the form of flood, famine and disease were so enormous from 1941 to 1945 that any follow up on the land revenue commission recommendations were unthinkable. The condition of Bargadars however, went on steadily worsening, worsening since despite the famine the sharecroppers obligations to surrender half of their produce to the Jyotidars remain unchanged. Between 1940 to 42, several leaders of Kisan Sabha were intended which gave them an opportunity to sharpen their understanding of the agrarian crisis and the nature of class conflict in the countryside. A clear articulation of the notion of peasant and the class base of the party emerged through that process of maturation. The Kisan Sabha by 1945 has become predominantly poor peasant organization. At the time of natural disaster, the communist units, the Kisan Sabha workers who were already released engaged themselves in the massive famine relief works. They set up the relief committees uh, and the grain co cooperatives in the Mofsil districts and organized some of the relief kitchens which led at least uh, uh, around uh, 117,000 destitutes every day. These relief activities enabled the CPI and the Kisan Sabha to consolidate themselves organizationally. In 1945, the Kisan Sabha had some 77,000 members in nearly a thousand of villages and about thousand full time organizers in Bengal districts. In the course of the relief work, Kisan Sabha workers advised tenants and bargadars to withhold the rent or share 
of crop. But the actual struggle for Tebhaga calling for direct action from the share copper was to retain the two thirds share of the produce for themselves and to pay the Jyotidar only the one third that was launched in September 1946. Now let us try to see what is the nature of the share coppers revolt uh, because ultimately after understanding the agrarian social structure and also the sort of organization which has been there at the different levels uh, with regard to the present mobilizations we have discussed about that. Now let us try to see what is to be seen in terms of an outcome as a share coppers revolt. So, the movement started first in a village Atwari in the northwest Dijanpur where several Bargadars volunteers cut the paddy crop and carried it to their own Khamar. Khamar is basically the threshing floor. Instead of taking it to the Jyotidars Khamars as they used to do in the past. So, virtually it was something which was revolutionary in nature. When the police intervened, the present police clashes followed and fearing the mass arrest, the Kisan Sabha and the communist leaders who spearheaded the movement went underground. The resistance of the sharecroppers was initially more intense in the Thakurgaon subdivision of Dijanpur district, but within a fortnight the movement spread to several villages covering nearly three-fourths of their districts. Because it was a harvesting season, the agitation spread very fast. By the middle of the December 1946, the movement has gained momentum in the 11 districts and over 1000 Kisan Sabha workers and the present volunteers has been arrested. Everywhere the pattern of the struggle was the same in the Bengal. Another stronghold of the movement was Mayaman Singh district in East Bengal. In the northern Susang region of the district, the Hajong tribals turned the tenant paid tanka that is a fixed quantity of crop as a rent to their landlords. In the central and the southern parts of the bulk of share coppers were either Muslims or tribes, whereas the Zamindar, Talukdars and the big Jyotidars were mostly Hindus, though a few of them were Muslims. Hence, the agrarian movement in the district was a mixture of Tanka and the Tibhaga struggles. So, both the things have come together to make the things more volatile. However, due to the famine in 1946, mobilized by the communist demanded the reduction of tanka rent uh, to go for the cash rent. That was uh, one issue which was been raised. Uh, they retained the crop with them and followed the guerrilla activities armed with the guns. The Bengal government realized the problem and provided the tenurial security for the Bargadars and two-third rent for the Bargadars and one-third for the Jyotidars. So, ultimately uh, this particular thing was been initiated by the Bengal government. Now, apart from that, uh, we have another important things uh, which we try to see uh, with regard to Bengal that is the initiations of the land reforms which are directly or indirectly related to uh, this whole movement. So, if you try to see the Bengal Tenancy Act that is in short we can call it as a BT Act that was in 1885 which was enacted after a series of peasant uprising from the middle of the 19th century. The more serious among them were the Santhal revolution, uh, rebellions that was in 1855 to 57, the Blue Mutiny that is the Indigo <coughs> in 1859 to 61, the Fourth Rebellion of Swandeep in 1870 and the Peasant Revolt in Sirjan Gange in 1872-1873. The BT Act 1885 that is the Bengal Tenancy Act 1885 attempted to control the greed, rapacity and the cruelty of zamindars and the tenure holders to protect the tenants by giving them the rights regarding the security of tenure, fairness of rent, legal processes for ejectment and the other things. The massive sur survey and settlement operations were launched in the several districts to record the rights, interest of the different grades of tenure holders, tenants and other interest <coughs> holders in lands to reduce the conflict and to restore uh, the peace and amity in the rural Bengal. And it has did succeed in the large measures while defining the rights and obligations of types of tenants like the settled riots, occupancy riots and under riots and other categories. 
the BT Act kept the position of sharecroppers rather indeterminate. It however provided a broad definition of tenant, basically it stated that if someone cultivated the lamb or land of another person on consideration of paying rent either in cash or in kind or both, the former would be regarded as the tenant of the later. So, in 1923, the Bengal Legislative Council appointed a committee under the chairmanship of Sir John Carr to draft an amendment to the BT Act. The committee laid down the principle that produce that produce paying cultivators who supplies their own seed and cattle and themselves choose the crop should be treated as tenants. In a way, it formalized the view expressed by the settlement officers in the several districts and not uh, in concert, but it has to be taken independently. Now, let us try to see that uh, what has uh, been there with regard to the Bargadars, what is the outcome uh, which we try to see for the Bargadars. So, in 1938, the Bengal government appointed the Land Revenue Commissioner to inquire into the existing land revenue system under the chairmanship of Sir Francis Floud. The commission popularly called the Floud Commission in its report in 1940 made some radical recommendations. It recommended the abolition of zamindari system. On the issue of Bargadari, it had some uh, comments to make. It observed that the provision in the Tenancy Act of 1928 which definitely declared the Bargadars with the few exceptions to be the laborers was uh, to see in terms of retrograde measures. At present probably one fifth of the land in Bengal is cultivated for zamindars, ten, uh, tenure holders, rayats or under rayats by the people, most of whom themselves hold the lands as rayats or under rayats and to all of whom the agriculture is an ancestral profession. Socially, they are regarded in their village as having a better status than the laborers. Many Bargadars are original tenants who have lost their lands in the civil court for the failure to pay their rent and for the other liabilities. Some belong to the aboriginal tribes like the Santhals who originally brought land into cultivation but were gradually bought up by their landlords or creditors and were converted into the serfs. Having considered all the aspect of the matter, the commission said that our recommendation is that the provision of Sir John Kerr's bill should be restored by which it was proposed to treat as tenant Bargadars who supply the plough, cattle and agriculture implements. If it is thought diffi too difficult to frame the workable definitions, then all Bargadars should be treated as tenants. We also recommend that the share of the crop legally recoverably from the uh, for them from them be one third instead of half. Although we recognize that there may be a practical difficulties in enforcing the limitations, in this simple straightforward recommendation of declaring all Bargadars as tenants, the commission indicated the interpretation of a number of British and the Indian settlement officers of the definition of tenant in the original BT Act and conferring the tenancy rights to the Bargadars prior to the amendment of 1928. It is also put to shame the disgraceful and uh, convoluted argument by the Hindu Congress Swaraji members of Bengal Legislative Council in denying any benefits to the Bargadars. During the debate of the infamous tenancy bill of 1928 to protect their own uh, malfested sectarian advantages. At this stage, it would be interesting to consider the stand taken by the Bengal Provincial Kisan Sabha on the issue in 1939. The Kisan Sabha submitted a learned and lengthy memorandum to the commission. It was a long essay on the agrarian economy of the Bengal which was in 61 printed pages, but it was delightfully vague about the issue of Bargadars though the memorandum contained a section on it. All that it was to say as far as this class that is the Bargadar is concerned, the main object of the legislation should be to give back to them a definite legal status. It did not elaborate on what that status should be. There was no reference to the share of the crop, 
nothing was said about the repeal of the Tenancy Act 1928, which denied all legal rights to Bargadars. The memorandum did not take a strong stand against the Congress Swarajist anti Barga lines, perhaps being too afraid to antagonize the middle class Bhadralogs of Bengal, who were in the forefront of the struggle for independence. They found no contradictions between their fight for freedom from the colonial rule and maintaining a form of serfdom in their private domain. So, I think uh, these are certain things uh, which happened with regard to the Bargadars, and we also let us try to see that what are the social forces uh, that has weakened the movement uh, and uh, how we try to see that this movement has nearly come to an end. Uh, in Burdwan, where which was seen as a large number of cultivators having the sharecroppers, but the middle peasantry dominated the party and the Kisan Sabha, there was no Tebhaga movement. Uh, this is quite surprising. In spite of uh, the large number of cultivators and sharecroppers, uh, there was no Tebhaga movement in Burdwan. Lahiri writes, one possible reason might have been that the leadership in the district had felt that this movement would create contradictions within the present movement itself. One admires the dexterity with which the old faithful Lahiri tried to save his old party from utter embarrassment. But the fact remains that it was the middle class interest that prevented the movement taken off in the Burdwan. The oppressive state coercion, lack of clear perspective and determination of the communist leadership of Kisan Sabha and the overarching communal politics of partition combined to subdue the Tebhaga movement. The Kisan Sabha and the party were looking for the face saver which the Wali Premier of Bengal, the Muslim League HS Surhawardi provided by circulating a bill conceding the major demands of the movement. The party allowed the movement to fizzle out and Surhawardi promptly withdrew the bill on the ground of impending constitutional changes. It would perhaps be too harsh to accuse the party and the Sabha of betraying the movement, but there is no denying that the Sabha leadership totally failed to give the guidance and support uh, which could have resulted in some gains for the Bargadars. In 1948, there was a militant present movement in Kakadeep, Barak, Malpur and few other places. As usual, there were effective sub effectively suppressed with no advantage to Bargadars. B. C. Roy as the chief minister of West Bengal could have undergone the historical injustice to the Bargadars by repealing the 1928 act. Of course, the party and the Sabha did not demand it and Roy did not, not do it, being true to his anti burga line of 1928. Instead, he passed the Bargadar Act 1951, which provided for dispute settlement machinery and some other minor points. The party and the Sabha accepted it and great victory of the, uh, uh, of the field movement. In sheer semantic and exercise in self delusion, it is difficult to surpass them. While recommending the tenancy status to Bargadars, the flout commission expressed an apprehension. It observes that the chief argument against any proposal to improve the status of Bargadar is that as soon as it has become publicly known, the great majority of the Bargadars would be turned out. This fear was quite valid at the time when it was recorded. But under the Operation Barga, where 1.6 million Bargadars were recorded in the records of right given the security of tenure and other benefits, conferment of the title of the lands they cultivate would not have caused any ejectment or eviction problem. Once the new law would be in place, the whole operation of bestowing the title could be smoothly and quickly done. But the left front government did not show any willingness to do so. That is why they did not do it because they would not want to do it. The middle class entrenched itself much more strongly in the CPIM after the left wing came to power in 1977. In 1978, the left front government held elections for the three tier of panchayats after almost the two decades. The CPIM at the time had 
the total membership of around 30,000 in West Bengal concentrated mainly in the urban and the metropolitan areas. They had hardly any base in the rural areas. In 1978, they had to put up nearly 80,000 candidates, the middle and the upper peasantry who had hitherto uh, been the, with the Congress moved over to the CPIM and masses. They came in to protect their own class interest. The party welcomed them because now they form its much needed rural base. It was the win-win situation for both the sides. The matter became clear when a survey of the class character of the newly elected panchayat members of 1978 showed the only, that only 7 percent of the members were from the Bargardars and the landless labor groups. The remaining 93 percent was from the land owning and the professional classes. So, I think the result was quite shocking. The nature of Tebhaga movement leaves little doubt on the whole that the sharecropper's resistance was weak and that no occasion did they seem to be threatened the very structure of authority of the system they were part of it. Was this the weakness inherent in the class position of the Bargadars in the agrarian social structure in Bengal or did it stem from certain external forces? This is the most important point for discussion. An examination of the attitude and the role of Muslim peasantry in the Tebhaga movement, the timing of the struggle and of the general historical conditions and the political context in which it, uh, it occurred might provide us with some important clues. In Dijanpur district, it appears that only the Rajbansi and the Santhal tribals participated in the movement wholeheartedly. The Muslim peasantry did not readily participate with the result that the Kisan Sabha had to depute a prominent Muslim workers to draw the Muslim Bargadars into the struggle. Those who did participate in the movement also began to desert it soon after the police firing in Balur Ghat, Thakur Gaon and other places. They even promptly surrendered Paddy to their Jyotidars in Rangpur district. Both the Rajbansi and the Muslim Bargadars had collectively launched the movement by taking the Paddy crops to their own Khamars. But even when some Muslim Jyotidar finally attacked the Hindu and the tribal share croppers, the leader of the, this movement disallowed any retaliation, feeling that such reprisal against the Muslim Jyotidars might rupture the class unity of the Hindu tribals and the Muslim Bargadars and might spark off the serious communal strife. The two explanations are possible for the ambulance of Muslim peasant. The first is the agrarian classes in Bengal as elsewhere in India were also partially isomorphic with the community based social categories such as type of religion, uh, religion, tribes and caste. It is true that the bulk of actual tillers, both poor peasants and the landless laborers were Muslims, Adivasis and Harijans, whereas the zamindars, landlords and Jyotidars were mostly the upper caste Hindus as well as the Muslims. But each class category was not homogeneous in terms of its religious caste and ethnic composition, nor did the member of one single community based category belong to the same socio-economic stratum. Such interpretation of one set of categories by other must have posed the enormous problem for the Kisan Sabha leaders in building up a class organization and launching the Tebhaga as a class based movement. The success was only partial cannot be overemphasized. The second explanation is that whatever is the unity of the class struggle, it tended to be eroded by the upper class appeal and manipulations of the primordial loyalties within the peasantry. The talk of the transfer of power and partition in India was in the air from 1940s. The Muslim League represented basically the Muslim upper and the middle classes of and landlords that its appeal for a separate nation swept across all economic strata of community and unified them politically. Consequently, in Bengal, the Muslim League steadily gained ground. It tries to win over the Muslim peasantry through the hostile propaganda against the CPI and the Kisan Sabha. Despite the spirited opposition, the Kisan Sabha mustered the support from some Muslim peasants and some of its local leaders were Muslims. But this did not detract from the fact that ever large pop proportion of Muslim peasants in Bengal supported the league from 1940 onwards. 
So, the growing communal politics in Muslim majority province like Bengal led to one of the worst communal riots in the Indian history in the August 1946 uh, with the resultant traffic of refugees uh, we try to see that these things were more worse. The tragic instances uh, in incidents continued to occur almost until the beginning of the Tebhaga movement and the intense communal conflict was bound to dampen the Tebhaga struggle. The large number of Muslim peasants now deserted the Kisan Sabha and refused to participate in the agrarian agitation. Thus, the communal politics vastly diminished the scope of the class struggle of the Tebhaga movement. The Tebhaga revolt therefore never assumes the serious proportion uh, it used to claim. In fact, although the situation had potential for a massive peasant rebellion, it did not develop into one. The total number of peasants killed in the whole episode uh, with the police did not exceed 50, although uh, 3,119 arrests were made which is considerably large. It is significant in this context that not a single Jyotidar was killed, not a single Jyotidar house was burned down. The reason seemed to be that the Tebhaga was only a struggle to obtain the two-thirds share of the produce for the Bargadars and the scope of revolt could obviously not be extended beyond the limits imposed by the very nature of the issue. Thus, once the Bargadar removed the paddy to their khamars, the struggle in the sense was over. So, the above discussion suggest that the weakness of the Tebhaga movement was not inherent in the class position and the structural dependence of the Bargadars in the agrarian social structure of Bengal. Rather, the communal politics and the general political movement in the country turned over out to be the overwhelmingly decisive. Above all, the particularistic nature of the Bhaga issue not only circumscribed the scope of struggle and underplayed the more oppressive character of system of land control, but also brought to the surface the differences within the Kisan Sabha. This obviously weakened the resistance, move, <coughs> weak, uh, resistance of the movement and consequently the share croppings, the highly retrograde mode of agriculture production in Bengal continued even after the Tebhaga struggle ended. The formal exercise of the Zamindari abolition in the post-independence uh, land reforms too has left the grievance of the sharecropper unaddressed. Those uh, very grievances of the poor presently in Bengal loomed large in the 1960s cons constituting a sort of a agrarian radi radicalism that has come to be known as Naxalism in India in the later phase and I think uh, we will be discussing about this particular issue in the later phase. So, virtually one can say uh, as a concluding remarks that the Tebhaka movement was the outcome of politicization of the peasantry in Bengal while the agrarian class structure, the social change that was taking place in the mid 40s and the economic crisis that was following uh, during the war and the famine situations were all conducive to the such resistance, resistance movement. Uh, without CPI and Kisan Sabha activi activity, the Tebhaga struggle would not have developed. So, somewhere we try to see that uh, the role of CPI uh, and Kisan Sabha becomes very prime, but uh, to what extent they were in a position to uh, help in the mobilization of the peasantry, that is going to be an important question. But more importantly, we have to see that uh, the movement also demonstrate uh, sometimes the politicization uh, which can weaken the rebellion impulse of the peasantry. So, ultimately we try to see that uh, these sort of efforts uh, which has been made by the various leaders of Kisan Sabha, uh, they basically uh, try to mobilize the peasantry, but uh, because of sometimes the communal politics or on the issue of uh, the divide which has been there uh, between uh, the Hindus and the Muslims uh, because of lack of uh, the uniform uh, composition of uh, the peasantry or the Jyotidars in terms of uh, the caste, in terms of the religion or in terms of the ideology. So, these are certain things uh, which has basically uh, made the things into trouble, but virtually we try to see that the Tebhaga movement in Bengal uh, that was in bit, uh, mid 40s was really seen as a strong struggle by the sharecropper to retain the two thirds share of their produce for themselves, but uh, they could not do much for uh, how to overcome the problems which they were facing against the Jyotidars. 
to some extent there was certain control which has took place with regard to abolition of the zamindari system uh, that has happened but more importantly what is required is that we have to see that to what extent uh, these peoples were in a position to have the strong uh, political support i think that is going to be an important issue because uh, the leadership uh, which they could have thought of at the national level uh, that could not come for their rescue and uh, sometimes we can say that uh, multiple factors uh, which has tried to dilute maybe the issue which took place especially uh, we have the the whole tyranny of uh, the bengal famine uh, which was in the midway and also uh, the sort of war which was going on and also the india's fight for struggle uh, in terms of independence all these things have basically made the things uh, more volatile but parallelly uh, the issues which try to dilute uh, the intensity of uh, the sharecroppers towards their rights uh, that has become uh, mild uh, under these circumstances so the tebhaga movement uh, from 46 uh, to 48 i think uh, uh, it has its full intensity uh, through which it tries to show the major present upheaval in the bengal and it was a movement of the 20th century but the movement uh, failed uh, to some extent uh, because the sacrifices which has been made by the sharecroppers in terms of uh, keeping the uh, cultivation with themselves uh, that was a strong sign for the resistance uh, against the jyotidars uh, and also uh, we try to see that operation bargha uh, which has been launched uh, which tries to overcome certain amount of uh, uh, restoration of the land rights but it also could not be very successful in terms of uh, the contribution uh, which has to be made by <coughs> the so called uh, share croppers so virtually uh, these are certain issues uh, that uh, we try to see are going to be uh, very uh, silently done and they could not make the things more volatile in terms of uh, making the things more intensive and also it could make uh, things more fruitful basically in the larger interest of the share croppers so virtually we try to see that uh, uh, these sort of initiatives definitely uh, if you try to see the hard uh, face of tebhaga which we'll try to see in the uh, coming discussion when we'll try to speak about uh, the issue related to uh, the naxalbari movement uh, which is an ongoing debate uh, even in the contemporary scenario i think that is where we have to see that uh, the sharp face of tebhaga can be seen in terms of a present struggle and uh, i think uh, regarding uh, the sort of references uh, about uh, uh, this movement the tebhaga movement of bengal uh, there are multiple sources which one can see especially one can read the work by d n dhanagre uh, that is present movement in india uh, which is in published in 1983 uh, it's from oxford university press and also we have uh, multiple other readings uh, especially we have the work by manoranjan mohanty partha mukherji and oli tonquist on people's right social movement and the state in the third world uh, that is from the sage publication and also we have the work by partha chatterjee on bengal from 1920 to 1947 uh, on this issue of the land question so i think uh, these are certain thing works uh, which one has to really see and the ultimate of course is the air the size work of in 1986 that is the agrarian struggle in india after independence that is from oxford university press so these works i think uh, can help you further in guiding uh, how to we how we can see uh, this movement in a more descriptive way we are not the student of history uh, we have to see uh, the movement in terms of the social structure the sort of mobilization which has to be there but more important is that we have to see that what forces has made this movement to come to its genesis and also what are the factors which has led to the decline of this movement that becomes more important so ultimately we have to see this movement in a holistic framework and that is the attempt which has been made uh, in the discussion that i had so thank you for the patience listening and we will interact again uh, for the further uh, present movements uh, in the coming phase thank you to all of you